Good evening. Uh, this is Dr. David Knox of the Kenna MDs, and uh, I was uh, asked to give a little uh, talk uh, this evening about uh, cannabis overdosage. Uh, there's a little debate sometimes you can see uh, online about whether people can really overdose with cannabis, and uh, so I hope I'll lend a little light to that subject here tonight. Um, as a longtime emergency room physician, I think I've learned a little bit about uh, toxicology and, uh, you know, seen a few uh, cases of uh, cannabis overdose. So um, to start off with, you know, most people think of uh, the idea of overdosing as, uh, you know, toxic or fatal effects. And uh, when you, you know, read a lot of uh, uh, information, uh, you see that research shows that uh, THC is actually very safe, and uh, even the Huffington Post states that uh, there are still no deaths attributable to marijuana uh, despite its widespread use. Um, they've also done animal studies that show there's a tolerance for blood levels of THC up to 1,000 milligrams per kilogram, and uh, that translates to about 70 grams in the average uh, uh, fictional 70-kilogram person. Uh, now, the primary reason that cannabis is considered so non-toxic as far as causing deaths is because of the way it works physiologically in the body. As opposed to opiates and alcohol, which uh, have very strong effects on the brainstem, uh, which is our site for respiratory control and other autonomic function of the heart and blood pressure. Uh, for example, with uh, opiates, persons lose their respiratory drive, and uh, uh, subsequently they become hypoxic and uh, hypercarbic, that is, their carbon dioxide builds up in the blood, and uh, they generally die from a respiratory arrest. Alcohol also affects the brainstem, and, uh, you know, it can really affect the autonomic function of the heart and the blood pressure and uh, also result in death for that reason. You know, on the other hand, cannabinoid receptors are very scarce in the brainstem as opposed to other areas in the brain. And as a result, they do not cause brainstem depression. Uh, that is, it has really no effect on the respiratory drive. And uh, so that is why, you know, even with extremely high concentrations of THC, that by itself will not cause death. <clears throat> All right, now, does this mean that there's uh, really uh, no association between deaths and cannabis use? Uh, just not so fast there, because uh, uh, I really think this is one area where we need to know what we are talking about uh, especially when it comes to politics and uh, you know laws and regulations concerning the use of cannabis. So, uh, when you start looking at uh, medical examiner uh, reports uh, for cause of death, there are hundreds of thousands that mention marijuana as a contributing factor. Uh, most often, uh, you'll see that marijuana is in association, uh, association with other drugs, uh, most commonly alcohol. Uh, but it is mentioned. Um, more specifically, you know, there may be uh, other close associations, shall we say. Uh, there was an article out of the United Kingdom that listed five deaths as a result of cannabis. Uh, but when you look at the details, what really caused the deaths was vomiting and aspiration, blocking the airway, and... Uh, uh, in their uh, autopsy, the cannabis was the only drug found in their system. Uh, you know, in these cases, the death was really due to asphyxiation, but there's still an open-ended question, you know, what caused the vomiting and their inability to protect their airway in the first place? So uh, you, you have to be a, a little concerned about that type of a report. Um, there have been a few cardiac deaths that have associated with the use of cannabis, either long-term use um, or also directly associated with active use. Um, now I understand most of these have occurred in persons who had underlying heart disease, which certainly places them in a much higher risk group. Um, but, uh, you know, we know that cannabis does have physiologic effects. It can increase your heart rate, 
Uh, there's some increased frequency of irregular heart rhythms and, uh, you know, other effects on the cardiovascular system. Uh, so it's still a little bit of a question whether you can uh, indict uh, cannabis as the cause of death or, or not. Um, and then there are other deaths that are attributed to behaviors that seem to be caused by the acute intoxication um, or particularly a toxic psychosis that uh, can, can occur with uh, extremely high doses of, of THC. Um, there was a recent report out of Colorado where a naive user jumped to his death off a balcony after becoming extremely uh, agitated and uh, paranoid after ingesting an entire uh, cannabis lace cookie. Uh, so uh, it's, it's one of those things where the uh, direct toxicity may not be there, but uh, in uh, you know, the political realm, there's still a fair bit of concern uh, whether it, uh, it could be indictable. So, um, you know, when you look at it, though, from a statistical point of view, uh, the safety profile of cannabis is extremely good. Um, now, when you talk about a safety profile, what we're talking about is, you know, what is the risk to any individual user uh, who uses a, a substance and uh, with cannabis is extremely low. And uh, also there is an extremely high ratio when you're talking about an effective dose versus a toxic dose. So, um, you know, it's, it's uh, almost uh, in, uh, infinity when you're talking about cannabis, whereas there are certainly medications on the market that have a very low, you know, uh, a dose of one is therapeutic, you double it, uh, triple it, and you are into toxicity. So that's a very narrow uh, uh, ratio of a, uh, effective to a toxic dose. Uh, so in that sense, you know, cannabis has an extremely good safety profile. And uh, these cases I mentioned are extremely rare, tiny numbers compared to the millions of users uh, worldwide. Uh, but rare events make the headlines, and that's why they kind of have a disproportionate effect on politicians and uh, bureaucrats who are making decisions and uh, drafting laws. Uh, so... Shades of reefer madness. We uh, don't like to see these things making the headlines, but uh, on the other hand, I think it's irresponsible to totally ignore the possibility of some toxicity. So, um, wanted to uh, uh, talk a bit about what is an overdose, though, really. You know, the medical definition is the administration of an excessive dose, either accidental or intentional, uh, above the no dose normally used. Uh, for therapeutic effect. Um, usually we only apply the term uh, OD if the amount taken results in adverse effects. So uh, yes, cannabis use can result in an overdosage. Uh, there are many users who at some point have gotten into a place where they don't want to be. Uh, they may be extremely uncomfortable uh, they often describe feeling uh, like they're going to die, even though they won't. Um, and uh, in the vernacular, people will just call it a bad trip, or uh, a new term to me, they called it greening out. Um, you know, we know that uh, cannabis does cause physiologic effects, and uh, these effects can certainly increase with higher doses. Uh, so when you're talking about... Uh, Overdosage or greening out uh, symptoms often will include a real rapid heart rate, uh, feeling of shortness of breath or uh, other breathing difficulty. Uh, certainly you get pupillary dilation and the red eyes. Uh, people will often have dry mouth. Uh, and these are all autonomic kind of symptoms. People often become disoriented, uh, even to the point of delirium and uh, not understanding, you know, what's going on. Um, often there will be panic attacks uh, involved, and uh, sometimes uh, nausea and vomiting is a prominent symptom. Uh, as an aside, you know, the uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome uh, could be considered a form of uh, uh, cannabis overdosage. Uh, but that's uh, quite a uh, long topic in of itself. So, um, 
Um, other symptoms, people will have a very impaired perception, and uh, it does have some effect on motor skills. So if you in that kind of a space, uh, you could conceivably call that a uh, uh, overdose. Um, more rare occurrence, uh, acute toxic psychosis has been described, and uh, people can have frank hallucinations and delusions, uh, a loss of sense of self uh, uh, recognition, and uh, extreme paranoia. Um, so uh, when you see these kind of uh, severe reactions uh, that affects a person's behavior, uh, that can often place them in an uh, area where they are at much higher risk of harm. So uh, cannabis overdose with this type of symptoms does occur. And uh, a lot of times what uh, we're reading in the uh, Mass media is that there's a concern. There's an increasing number of ER visits for overdose. And uh, there's going to be an impending crisis if we continue to legalize cannabis. Um, looked at some data from Colorado. And uh, since they had uh, legalization of the recreational use of cannabis, they've had a 173% rise in ER visits. Um, other states report a significant rise in calls to their poison control centers. Um, so there's uh, some uh, published concerns about uh, uh, this as a, a problem. Most common complaint that people have is simply anxiety. Uh, patients will describe a uh, feeling of impending doom, and they'll feel their heart is pounding or racing, their chest feels tight, they feel short of breath, Extremities get numb and tingling, and uh, they get extremely distressed with these symptoms. Um, that description that I just gave you, though, really is a, a panic attack or hyperventilation syndrome. Uh, you breathe rapidly, you blow down carbon dioxide, that changes the whole acid-base balance in your bloodstream, and uh, you get these symptoms. So. Uh, you may feel uh, impending doom, but you really are not going to die from it. Um, so those are uh, kind of the most common uh, uh, complaint that uh, we ever see in the emergency room. Uh, things like the uh, significant toxic psychosis are extremely rare, thankfully. Um, and... Uh, you know, the other element uh, to these type of reactions that many patients uh, afterwards describe that they do have uh, a significant hangover symptom uh, that sometimes will persist up to several days. Uh, I was reading a blog that uh, a patient claimed that he uh, had really symptoms for more than a week, and uh, so he thought it was uh, quite a significant problem. So the question is, you know, who's at risk for overdosing? Um, what we see is that uh, overdosage most often occurs with use of edible products and uh, combined with a naive user. That was someone who has a little experience with the use of cannabis. Uh, edibles, uh, 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 particularly uh, baked goods and candies, often have higher, more concentrated levels of THC which makes it much more easy to exceed your uh, desired dosage. Uh, there's also delayed absorption uh, through the GI tract. And uh, uh, up to two hours before, you, you even start noticing any effect, and a lot of patients are just uh, uh, not able to wait that long. They get impatient, and they ingest more. And uh, then when it finally comes on board, uh, they have far exceeded their desired effect. Um, you know, the other uh, physiologic thing that occurs, first-pass metabolism uh, is through the liver when you ingest it, as opposed to uh, smoking uh, and uh, other ways uh, it hits the bloodstream and goes direct to the brain. You really know how much you're getting. Uh, you wait for that first-pass metabolism, and the uh, most significant thing that occurs is that delta-9 THC, uh, we know as the psychoactive uh, form of, uh, of THC, actually gets metabolized to 11-hydroxy-THC, 
which is also psychoactive, but even more so than the Delta-9. Uh, and that's why uh, people report getting so incredibly heavily stoned when they do uh, edibles as, composed to, uh, as opposed to smoking. So uh, this brings up kind of an interesting aside in that uh, when you further broke down the Colorado statistics where they had such an increase in the uh, ER visits for uh, cannabis overdosage, uh, these were almost always non-residents. Uh, the non-resident visits uh, virtually doubled while the rate of admissions for Colorado residents was unchanged. Uh, and this was all since uh, the legalization. Um, so why is that? Uh, probably because most non-residents come to Colorado with the idea they are going to indulge, and uh, they're naive to the edible products, how much they should be taking and everything, and... Uh, they get into trouble. Um, I also understand that Colorado did a, a fairly good job of putting out some uh, publicity about uh, being cautious with edibles, and uh, that may have had some benefit. So, um, at any rate, uh, uh, that's usually the situation in my experience in the emergency room. I'd say virtually every overdose uh, that I've seen uh, was related to use of an edible and a, a naive uh, person. So uh, one other concern, though, is the increase in popularity of dabbing, which uh, uh, uses extracts or rosins, which often contain a very high level of THC. Um, and, uh, you know, attended a conference where the uh, director of the Oregon uh, Poison Control Center reported uh, on a couple of patients, uh, one of whom was a male who was having a heart attack after inhaling a very large quantity of dab resin. Uh, another uh, patient uh, involved was a child who got into their parents' homemade shatter and uh, actually ended up having a very prolonged hospital course. Uh, so... Uh, those are little concerns with the, uh, the high-potency type products that are uh, available out there. Now, speaking of children, uh, there's always a higher level of concern, and uh, politicians are always quick to acknowledge the risks to this pediatric population. Um, so I think we also have to pay attention to that uh, when we're talking about overdosage. Uh, young children often won't report the uh, type of symptoms that uh, we noted previously. Uh, their presentation is often of very uh, uh, sleepiness, uh, even to the point of near comatose uh, appearance. Uh, they'll be extremely wobbly and weak, unable to hold their head up. Uh, they won't be able to eat or drink normally. Um, there's a report of even a few cases where children have had to be intubated for uh, respiratory support. Um, even though we've noted the absence of respiratory depression previously because it does not affect the brainstem, uh, these children were, uh, you know, that uh, incapacitated uh, that they needed that type of uh, uh, support in the views of the uh, physicians taking care of them. Um, I think as an aside, also, we've got to consider other things. Uh, for example, this Oregon case with the child, uh, the product uh, that uh, the child got into uh, was a homemade extract uh, using a butane-type method. Uh, so it's an open-ended question, where the, was it just the cannabis that... Uh, uh, cause so much uh, morbidity there. So ultimately, uh, the uh, lesson here is parents uh, need to treat their cannabis, especially their edibles and concentrates, as medicine with all the usual precautions that you would take with any medication around uh, your children. So... Uh, and say in most cases, you know, uncomplet episodes of uh, greening out really don't need medical advice or treatment. Uh, but what if your symptoms are so severe that uh, you can't tolerate it and you really feel you need to be seen? Uh, what happens when you go to the emergency room? Um, 
So to start off, uh, like anywhere, the whole goal is to prevent injury and uh, provide reassurance to a patient. And uh, I'd say in uh, most cases where uh, people are, uh, you know, greening out uh, uh, in the field, as we call it, um, you know, just reassurance is all they need to get through their symptoms. Um, now, if you uh, uh, usually have uh, symptoms bad enough to come to the ER, like you're hyperventilating, your heart racing, you are going to get evaluated. Uh, you know, probably we're going to do an EKG at least, uh, start an IV, draw blood, do laboratory type of work, uh, kind of depend on your symptoms, you know, especially if you have nausea and vomiting, uh, IV line may be used to give you back some fluids and, uh, and all. Um, if you do have severe anxiety, panic, or paranoia, you may be treated with a benzodiazepine. Uh, uh, most commonly, the one you use is Ativan, uh, like Valium. Um, rarely, uh, in some cases, uh, especially if you, uh, you know, have a heart condition, you, know, you may need medications for blood pressure or heart rate control. Um, so... Uh, Further intervention is virtually uh, uh, rarely needed, and uh, almost all of these patients recover quickly with a limited intervention over the course of uh, several hours. The uh, majority of patients, like I say, don't need to come to the emergency room, and uh, um, you know, reading the literature, uh, there are a number of things uh, listed that you can do to really counteract that uh, intolerable intense high that can occur. Um, of course, number one is to avoid it. Uh, we advise uh, patients, you should uh, know your limits uh, before consuming and know your products. Uh, you know, try to have a good idea of the concentration and quantities of uh, the cannabinoids in your products. Uh, you want to take it slow, especially being patient with your edibles. And, uh, you know, for a lot of folks, it's avoiding the peer pressure to overindulge. Now, if you do start feeling uh, overly high, uh, number one is don't panic. Uh, you just have to realize and remind yourself that these symptoms will pass. And uh, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time, that uh, will be the case. Uh, we recommend hydration. You, uh, drink water, juice. That certainly helps a dry mouth. And uh, also helps the body just uh, with general metabolism and excreting the, the drug. So uh, hydrate as much as you can, but no alcohol. Uh, you know, combination with uh, alcohol can increase your THC levels in the blood. So other ways to keep calm, uh, rest, and even try to sleep if you can. Uh, some people have said that even a short nap will get you through the worst of these symptoms. And uh, when you, uh, you know, wake up, you know, you're probably not going to feel as bad as uh, when it started. Uh, other distractions, you take a walk. Unless you're feeling lightheaded or dizzy, like you might uh, pass out, you don't want to put yourself at risk for falling or other injuries. Uh, you can shower or bathe. Sometimes that's a distraction that fi people find helpful. Um, otherwise, distract yourself with music, videos, talking, uh, eating. Uh, what you'll find is that the pleasurable activities will really directly counteract uh, the uh, panic and paranoia that you may be experiencing. And then uh, finally, there are ways to try to counteract the uh, uh, THC effect. Uh, we can't really call them antidotes, but uh, in a sense, they uh, uh, work that way. They counteract the effect in the body. Uh, number one is CBD. Uh, CBD modulates the receptors uh, that are signaling uh, from uh, THC. And, uh, you know, some uh, writers have, uh, uh, say, compared it to a dimmer switch on, an, uh, on a light. You, you dim the switch a little bit, and uh, you'll feel much, uh, much improved. Um, there's uh, some literature out there about use of black pepper. Uh, you chew on a few black pepper corns or even just sniff them, uh, 
and uh, it's uh, been uh, uh, touted to relieve anxiety and paranoia. Uh, it seems primarily related to the beta caryophyllin uh, content in the pepper that uh, will counter the THC. Uh, however, I saw a few other references that said, oh, black pepper treatment is a myth. Uh, so I don't know. I haven't had a need to try it myself. Um, another uh, approach is uh, to use the terpenes, which are naturally occurring in cannabis, but also a lot of other uh, fruits. Uh, for example, you can use lemon zest. Uh, you know, just ingest a tablespoon or two of uh, lemon zest, uh, which primarily can contains limonene uh, as a mean terpene, and it uh, can certainly counter a lot of the uh, THC effect in the, in the brain. Um, so I've covered, I think, uh, a fair bit of what we see, you know, on the emergency room aspect uh, uh, for cannabis overdosage. And uh, in the sense, uh, you know, you, question becomes, uh, is it a big problem? I don't think it's a uh, very big problem, uh, particularly when you look at the uh, number of cases compared to the number of users across the world, um, and uh, in the sense that uh, as far as toxicity, uh, most symptoms are really very easily treated. And uh, when I just look at my own experience, uh, you know, I'm in a suburban emergency room as opposed to some of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, high population uh, uh, urban settings, uh, you know, cannabis uh, overdoses is quite a minor problem. I would say I'd count the uh, number of patients I've seen directly for cannabis overdose uh, uh, with less than two hands. Um, uh, this compares to opiate ODs, which, uh, again, in our suburban environment uh, can be, you know, uh, several a week uh, to once a day, and uh, alcohol, which is uh, multiple patients on a daily basis. Um, so that, uh, you know, in the big scheme of things, uh, it uh, is not a huge problem. But again, uh, uh, come back to the, the fact that uh, any problems, uh, uh, they make the headlines because they're rare, uh, but often the publicity is what often dis uh, drives the decision makers. So um, don't like to see uh, too much of that. Um, so our recommendation for uh, all of you out there who are using uh, cannabis uh, medically, uh, you know, it is the uh, start low and go slow. Uh, we like to start with the higher CBD to THC ratio and then just gradually increase your THC to the uh, desired uh, uh, benefit. Um, that generally is going to, uh, you know, get you the uh, beneficial effect that you're looking for and uh, really put you at very low risk of having adverse uh, side effects. Um, when you look uh, back at the uh, physiology and uh, how the, the cannabinoids work in the, uh, in the body, you have to remember that a lot of them do have that biphasic effect of the dosage. As you increase the dosage, initially you get some uh, increase in uh, the therapeutic effects, but then it often peaks, and if you come down the other side, uh, that's when you can get more side effects and you uh, even risk losing the beneficial effects that you have been uh, looking for. So uh, that's just, uh, you know, general caution. You, you got to be patient with it. And uh, I hope that uh, this discussion has not uh, uh, dulled any of your enthusiasm for all the good things that cannabis can do. But I, I certainly think that uh, as we move ahead in the political realm, we have to recognize that it's not a no-risk situation but it is certainly uh, um, manageable, and I think with uh, more and more education that, uh, uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, show the world that it uh, can be used, uh, uh, as we know our patients are, effectively and responsibly. So. I hope that I've uh, 
you know, opened uh, up a little line of uh, information for you and uh, trying to look at a few of the uh, uh, little notes that are coming up here. I think I've uh, told me somebody says that uh, black pepper really does work, so that's, that's good to know. Um, and uh, a lot of other folks just have uh, kind of a typical thing. If you get an intense hit, you take a nap. And, uh, you know, but yes, yeah, so even medical uh, marijuana, uh, you can't overdose. You, you always, uh, you know, strange is what uh, gets marketed, but what we tell people, really try to know your profile. You know, what is the quantity of uh, THC, quantity of CBD, and your ratio? And uh, I think as we move along, you would really like to, you know, have even more information as far as the terpene profile, because that, uh, that's another part of it that does affect, you know, how the, the uh, other cannabinoids uh, work in the body, so... All right. Long-term user, never had a problem. I think that's probably true for a majority of patients. And uh, All right. Well, I think uh, pretty well I used my time up here, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, you'll keep coming back to our site. We're going to try to keep educating and uh, might be a few more weeks, but you have to look at this ugly mug here. My daughters will be online in the next few weeks. Thank you. <laughs>